it's up to you where you want to fit. So there are people out there, and I heard this literally in one of my presentations, that says, AI hey, is technology, which will put us all in a suit. So that's not too bad, sleeping 24 hours, getting fat, not too bad. But that was an opinion. Some people say you go anti minimum uh, Resistance is future. If you listen to Elon Musk, if you listen to Steve Hawkins, not anymore, but when he's still alive, if you, if you listen to Bill Gates, those are the people that are more in this dystopian field. Like AI is, is, is going to be bad. Under the assumption you don't get a handle on it. On the other hand, we've got utopian view. AI is our savior. We need it for mankind. AI is our new co-worker. So all the good stuff that you hear, whether it's in security or not, is all about the utopian view. This is great, this is the next big thing for mankind. Okay? And then there's anywhere in between. Okay? The discussion today is not where you are, I leave it up to you, but that's essentially the spectrum that we face today. One of the reasons why definitions are difficult is because there are so many of them. So these are examples of quote unquote formal definitions. Like you see one from Wikipedia, you see one from Gartner, now Gartner being Gartner having a page from definitions, which I'm not saying makes sense, but it's not okay if you read the page from definition. So you see, I always tend to say the longer the definition, the more problem you have to explain it. Okay? So, and when it comes down to AI, there is no formal definition. So instead of talking about trying to explain AI in a definition, I look at this as in characteristics. What characterizes artificial intelligence? It's intelligent behavior, human like, because that's what we know as intelligence. Okay. It's using technology, whatever technology that is, <coughs> and it's learned by technology. So the learning is, which I will do to uh, in a minute, is the key thing here. So it learns by example data. The previous speaker already talked about label data, for example. And it learns by rules defined by math and statistics. At the end of the day, if you look at all those fancy systems, like neural networks were mentioned, deep learning, reinforcement learning, I'm a little bit like a mic here, but it's nothing else than a bunch of math and statistics. So what do we have? Linear algebra, we have uh, calculus, and we have, for example, uh, root, root mean square error. Okay, so there are building basic blocks that are math um, that are the learning factors. Okay. So, if AI has some characteristics, what makes it really different? Learning. This is the key difference with the traditional program paradigm, is the learning aspect of it. And learning, in the sense that it's not programmed, like if this, if this then that statement. It's learned by a set of rules, as I said, based on math and statistics. That's the key. And I will show you a few examples in a minute. So the key difference is learning. Learning that is being learned, not pre-programmed. Let's go through a few examples to make this more concrete. The maze and the robot. So it's a simple goal. The robot has been uh, represented by the red one. The robot has to find the exit, which is the yellow given the starting point, and the goal is to minimize the penalty. That's it. There are two rules. The robot can go forward, backwards, left or right, and when he hits a wall, it gets a penalty minus one. That's it. Go figure it out. So, I don't know. That one doesn't work. Of course. Um, anyway, the point is that what's going to happen is that the robot is going to try to find a way through the maze. It's just going to try and experiment. Okay? So instead of programming like Okay, if this is the starting point, go right, go up, up, right, up, up, left, 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 up, right. You don't do that. That's the traditional programming. You just tell them the rules and off they go. And at one point they will find them off tomorrow. In this classification, recognizing dogs. Okay, it was already uh, mentioned in this classification. So, how does the system recognize dogs? There are two ways of doing this. 
the way to do it in artificial intelligence is to show a lot of examples. So here's what happens. I show them a, the dog of this one. And I ask the system, what is this? The system, I have no idea. Okay, it's a dog. Okay, show them the next picture. What is this? I have no idea. It's a dog. I do the third picture. What's this? I have no idea. It's a dog. Now, if you do that enough times, and I'm talking about tens of thousands or hundreds of thousands of examples, systems start to recognize that hmm, there is some, there are some characteristics in the picture um, that seem to be characteristic for a dog. Two eyes, there's a nose, most of them there's a smile, except for this one, that day at the office, I guess. <coughs> um, some hair, some whiskers. So the system is deciphering how a dog looks like. Okay? So if you do it enough times, the system understands what classifies the dog. You can do the same with a cat or any animal or any picture. Okay? Um, the technique that's used here is, you can forget the term as soon as I said, say it's convolutional neural networks. Anybody heard of them CNNs? Okay? Uh, so this is typical CNN and um, this is typical something also in the deep learning area. Um, so this is all their food. And the way how it works, I'm not going to explain it in detail, but we as humans think that when we see a picture, we see the picture all at once, which we do, but in your brain is being actually um, being processed in different parts. So for example, there are some lines here, lines make up a certain curve, makes up, in this case you talk about chairs, make up a chairs, you can do the same with elephants, so, when I explain to you about the dog, all those individual pieces like eyes and nose, they start at a certain level and build up to make the complete picture. That's how we believe in neuroscience, how our brain works. There's research going on at the moment with the, which debunks this actually, but that's beside this presentation now. But that's the way how a neural network learns how to classify images. Okay? Now, this is an example. Uh, Single versus plural. Imagine. You walk with your child on the street and the child says, one car. Okay. Walk down further and the child says, hey, three car. He said, no, three cars. Okay. Walk a little bit further, hey, one house. A little bit further, two house. No. Two houses. Okay. You start to wonder like, do you ever listen? Okay. You walk further and then all of a sudden he says, four cats. Ah. So you ask him or her, like, why do you say cats and not four cats? The answer probably will be along the lines like, well, you I notice when there is more than one, you put an S behind the word. So I derived the grammar rule that in order to make it plural, it's an ambus s. Okay, that's what I mean. I could also tell him, single plus s is plural. That's traditional programming. <coughs> See the difference? Okay, last example. <coughs> Recommender systems. Who uses Amazon, eBay, Spotify, Netflix, Shopify? No, almost everybody. Um, so, then you must have probably seen stuff like when you buy something on Amazon or look at it, it's difficult to read probably. Customers for all this item also bought this. Or if you have Spotify, if you listen to this music and you click on Discover, it comes up with suggestions based on music that you listen to. Those are what they call recommended systems. Okay? That's a part of unsupervised learning, but you see it in your daily life. So, here's the thing. And this it's not a surprise, but um, whether you know it or don't know it, you are using artificial intelligence on a daily basis. Okay? Whether it's in your face, like here, or whether it's not in your face, like digital profiling, which I'll come to in a minute, artificial intelligence is being used all the time. Okay. So we talked about AI characteristics. We talked about the fact what makes the AI different, which is learning. Another question that you see is, okay, is it really new? I mean, 
You read a lot about it. What is it really? New, new? Or what is it? Well, again, there are two sides of the coin. One argument to be known is not new because, well, the building blocks that are being used are known for decades, if not longer. For example, the math and statistics that you can your algebra is along for a long time. Okay? Calculus, which for some degree is great in the sense, which is used in optimization, is long, long among us. Statistics, same thing. Even if you look at the algorithms, like logistic and linear regression, logistic regression is a classifier, like is it A or B or is it man or female? Linear regression is where you try to predict a certain uh, uh, fix, for example, house price, the place of square foot is an area. Neural networks is, is decades old. The reason why neural networks all of a sudden now becomes into the picture again is not because it's new, but because we have more data and more compute power to our disposal. But neural networks were developed in the 60s, 70s. Okay? The concept of neural networks. Data. We have structured data, we have constantly data, you always have that data. So what's the big deal about big data? No commentary. Compute storage, we had CPUs, we had disks, we have networks, so what's the deal? Well, the deal is this. It is, it is not new, new, but it is different. So, some of you have met, uh, read that uh, the AI winter is over. Okay? So the 80s, 90s was an AI winter in the sense that there were sophisticated systems developed like neural networks. But they, still, they simply did not perform because they didn't have the data that they need and they didn't have the compute power. So nowadays, what do we see? We have fast and cheap compute power. We have special graphical process units which are ideal for linear algebra. We have TPUs, which stands for Tensor Pro uh, Process Units, which is a specific uh, process unit developed by Google for their artificial intelligence framework. We have artificial sized machine learning chips by NVIDIA, by Intel. So that's processing from software in hardware now. Okay? To speed up. We have tons of scores for, for dirt cheap. The Dropbox example was mentioned by the previous speaker. It's dirt, dirt cheap. Okay? We have cloud of two hours also dirt cheap. Communication, fast, fast internet, fast bandwidth. We have big data, that's a big thing, because that's the fuel for a lot of AI systems, remember? Especially in the case of uh, supervised learning, we need a lot of labeled data, otherwise it will not perform. And another thing, and you may not think about this initially, but that's also key, is the democratization of the whole AI movement. So, there are a lot of open source frameworks like this. Think about Python, think about TensorFlow, think about Keras. There is a lot of open data now. And there are a lot of books, massive online uh, uh, courses that you can follow. So here's a tip for people in the room who are interested in artificial intelligence but don't want to go back to college or university. First of all, it doesn't make sense because you don't have anything on this too. And second, there's a ton, a ton of good information out there to get you out to speak. If you're interested in, in, in what those resources are, come see me after the presentation. Uh, but there are tons of good courses out there that you can follow. Okay? I can just give you an example like Udacity or Coursera or YouTube. YouTube, you've got um, tons of books out there. And the beauty of the AI community is they are very open, they are very shared. They want to tell the world what's out there. Okay? So, <clears throat> anybody who wants to develop him or herself in AI has no excuse no ticket up to speed other than making time. And time is never an excuse because it's always a matter of fear. Okay? So there's lots of stuff out there for you to learn if you want to get your head on it. Okay. Now, that being said, not all intelligence is created equal. And I'm going to uh, spend a few minutes on this slide because this is where all the boss is about. This is where you get the dystopian versus utopian uh, stories. This is where people are calling the Skynet is wrong. The Skynet is coming. So let's break it down. Everything you see and read today is what they call narrow AI. 
So an AI, as the name implies, focuses on one specific task. They can do it very well, better than humans, but it's only one task. For example, if I have a self-driving car, and I tell a self-driving car, take me to the next second cup of the the car can get me there, no problem. Now I'm asking the car, make me a coffee. I have no idea what to do. Okay? So it's very specific. So that's today's era. Okay? It's impressive, but it's very specific. The big discussion you see in the news is about what they call artificial general intelligence. Okay? So this is all about the equivalent to human intelligence. Okay? So this is a system that can imitate or emulate us as a human, which includes creativity, which includes emotions, okay? which includes feelings. Now, the predictions here are all over the place. If you uh, listen to guys like Ray Kurzweil, who is from Singularity University, who is a top researcher in Google, um, he claims that somewhere around 245, 2045, we will have AGI. And then there are also groups that say that this will never happen. Why? Because humans, we have traits that are not computable, like emotions, feelings, and all that. Other people might say, well, that is up for debate, because our body is nothing more than a set of chemicals and neurons. So if we can compute and simulate neurons using the neural network, at the end of the day, an emotion is a is firing of neurons in your head. So at one point, if you have enough compute power, we might be able to simulate this. So there's a whole debate. I don't know the answer to that, nobody knows. But that's the debate about AGI. And the, the super set, the super AI, which surpasses human intelligence. This is, if you remember the slide, where we are being put potentially in a zoo, and we, we immediately drop from the top of the totem ball of the food chain to the bottom. Okay? Again, nobody really knows. I just wanted to show you this slide, because the lot of this, so two things. One, the whole discussion about where is this going is related to AGI, most of it. And second, everything you read about artificial intelligence, all the achievements, English classification, self driving cars, etc., recommended systems, is all in the field of narrow AI. Okay? Okay, almost done with the introduction, uh, to put it in perspective. So, where do we put all those terms? The previous speaker already showed, showed the slide with unsupervised supervised and learning. Um, so this builds on that, I would say. So there is a whole field of artificial intelligence, AI. A lot of people use AI and, and, and ML machine learning as two of the same terms. Technically, this is not true. Okay? Machine learning is a subset of artificial intelligence. It gets the most attention because the excitement within machine learning happens in the cool fields like DL, which stands for deep learning. RL, which stands for reinforcement learning, which are subsets to a certain degree of a big field called NN, you guessed it probably by now, which stands for neural networks. Okay, that's why it gets so much attention. I mean, I, I don't particularly problem when people talk about machine learning as, as artificial intelligence, we use the, the, the terms interchangeably, but technically it's not correct. And also because in the past, 10, 15, 20 years ago, when we talk about knowledge-based systems and static rules-based systems, so knowledge really programmed in the, if that's in the traditional programming paradigm, was considered artificial intelligence. Nowadays we laugh about it, like there's no artificial intelligence at all. Okay? Uh, one interesting uh, thing to note, maybe, um, who believes that Canada is in the top three in the world when it comes down to R&D in the field of AI? Only two, three. All right. Actually, most people claim Canada is number one. Okay. Why is that? Because we have a few what they call AI rock stars. Jeffrey Hinton in Toronto, who is the boss founder of Deep Learning. We have Richard Sutton, who is uh, the boss founder of Reinforcement Learning in Edmonton, Alberta. And we've got Joshua Benjo, who has pretty close work with these guys who is in Montreal. So Canada 
and it's something to be proud of, is in the top three, if not the top three, if not number one when it comes to AI research and development. And it's pretty impressive. The deployment of AI in AI companies or AI or in the government of Canada, not so much. Okay? Okay, just a little bit of a sign. Alright. I will quickly go over this because it's, it's essentially what's covered by the previous speaker, this is just a different way of viewing it. So we've got machine learning, supervised unsupervised learning, so supervised is with labeled data, unsupervised is with un, uh, unlabeled data or no-labeled data. And you can break that down in if you look at supervised learning intensification is the dog right here. Regression, we've got some house prices, find the optimal uh, fit. Clustering. For example, clustering like generation X, Y, and Z, which is part of supervised learning, and association, for example, recommendation systems. Okay? So, to conclude this uh, part of the presentation, here's the summary to take away Artificial intelligence has characteristics. So, it's using technology, intelligent behavior, learning. Okay? It's not just one thing. As I tried to explain, it's a whole ecosystem. Okay. As I alluded to, learning is key. Learning is the difference. Okay. There are different ways of learning, so deep neural networks, they learn different than the reinforcement learning. Okay. And narrow AI is ready for prime time. Okay. This is all you need to know to impress your friends and family. Okay. Alright. So this is the introduction to put AI in this practice. Everybody with me? Yeah? Alright. Now, let's talk about the stuff that really uh, excites me. What concerns me? AI in black box. There is a common concern in our society, and you must have seen this in the news, that AI is developed as a black box. So, what does that really mean? It means that we don't know how some of the AI systems really work. To be more precise, we don't know how they have optimized their internal working. So for example, a neural network, we know exactly how a neural network works. Because we have broken it. We know there's an input layer, there's one or more hidden layers, there's an output layer, there's data, there are all kinds of optimization techniques which I will not discuss today. So if you look at the metadata of a neural network, we know exactly how it works. But given the amount of data and the amount of parameters that can be trained, we have no clue why um, the neural network is behaving the way it is. It has to do with how it's learning. Okay, so we don't, when it comes down to the inner bubbles of the system, we, it's a black box, we don't know. Now, okay, <laughs> here's the irony. We don't know how our brain works. We think we do. So, bear with me here. So we try to explain a neural network that is supposed to simulate the brain of a brain that we don't understand ourselves. That's a vicious word. Okay? So the point is, even if it's a black box system, and even if we don't understand how it works, is it a problem? Maybe. Maybe not. Can we trust these systems? And if you cannot trust these systems, is that a problem? Well, that depends on the context. Let's take a look. Let's go through a few AI systems and let's see what you think about this. So, recommender system. I talked about it Netflix and Amazon. So, let's say you watch um, a lot of Netflix movies and you like Amazon movies. At one point, Netflix might say, hmm, we noticed that you watched uh, a lot of movies with The Rock. Maybe you like action movies with Van Diesel. It would be a little bit the same, some kind of actor. So, you watch one of Van Diesel's movies and you think, after one and a half an hour, like, this movie sucks. Okay? Okay. Honestly, no harm done. I mean, you might be a little bit irritated to spend one and a half hours to see that movie, so you waste a little bit of time. But did you have any, I mean, were you impacted that you were sick or something? Or did you have financial loss? Was your identity stolen? None of that. So it's like, okay, if it happens more often, you may get agitated. And you might say, you know what, I'm not going to call Netflix, good luck trying and call Netflix in the first place, but okay. Um, you just ignore it. Okay, so the context here is it's a recommended system in your personal life, but you may not really have an impact. So, 
essentially you don't care how their system works. Okay? Profilers. Everybody in this room is profile. Everybody. Okay? So we have social media profiles. So the Googles and the Amazons and the Facebooks of this world, they have a digital persona of you. They have a digital profile of you, which you hope is a reflection of who you are in the physical world. Not necessarily. But here's the thing. As a society, we are going into a data-driven, machine-generated and machine, yeah, machine-generated um, uh, solutions and decisions based on data more and more. That is becoming a problem if your digital profile deviates from your physical profile. So if they think Walker is completely jerk online because of the comments he makes, while well, in real life he's actually not a bad guy, that's a problem when I want to see, for example, a bank. Okay, if they take it into account. So the point is that because profiling has such an impact on us as individuals in our daily lives, that this becomes a problem if this is not correct. If you go to a bank, nowadays, the way how we look at the credits and mortgages is very simple. And we all know this, they look at a few things like your credit score and your debt ratio and all that stuff. Nothing really major. But what about if they're going to take into account your social network behavior? So, is it, is it a problem, yes or no? I don't know. So that's something like, if you go to a bank, any bank, and the bank says, sorry, more case is denied. And you ask the clerk, why? Don't know, the system says no. That's a problem, okay? Talk about life and death situations, MRI scan analysis. Imagine, you go to the hospital here, <coughs> you get an MRI scan, and um, you see the doctor and the doctor, okay. Yeah, don't worry, the system says this tumor is benign. No problem, see you in a year. Okay. Three weeks later, you get a phone call. Uh, yeah, sorry, there was a misdiagnosis. It's non benign, malignant. And by the way, here's three weeks later now, we have a problem. Excuse my language here, but this is, this is very personal to me. Uh, this shit is gonna happen. Okay? And it happens because it's part of our evolution. Okay? Now, that by itself is, is regretful, but the thing is, if it happens, we need to go back, why did this happen? Why did this happen in the first place, and how can we correct it? Even better, how can we avoid this? So, if this is a black box system, okay, and this happens, it's like, well, we will clean the proverbial ship when the ship is the fan, it's like, that's not good enough anymore, guys and girls. This is life in this situation, okay? So, now it becomes very, very quickly, very real, okay? None of all self-driving cars, for example. Self-driving cars, only other pedestrians, is not cool, okay? There was an accident with Tesla, you may have read about it, in March, April. Uh, despite the fact there was a human driver, supposed to be a supervisor, she was, she was watching the voice on her iPhone, so she didn't see it. Run over the pedestrian, old lady. And the CDC back from that. Again, that stuff is going to happen, and you want to know why did it happen, how can you correct it. So, my whole point with this slide is that the fact that the system is a black box and cannot be trusted may or may not be a problem depending on the context that you use. <coughs> so, I'm not saying that all AI systems are black box because they're not. I'm not saying that all black box AI systems cannot be trusted. I'm saying that uh, depending on the context, that more often than not, you want to know at least if you're going into a direction of a black box system, yes or not. <coughs> so make an informed decision, like, yeah, I know it's black box. I guess it's okay. Okay. It is. Alright? Alright. So then the question becomes, okay, if this is a problem, how to build trust in First, a quick word on what is trust? Well, that's a whole session on itself. A uh, simplified view on this is you have explicit trust and implicit trust. So explicit trust is made explicit by verification. Okay, verification is okay, you have to have transparency, you have to know, you have to have access to your system. Explainability is you have to be able to explain to the system. You are all working in the security field. One um, um, famous principle in crypto is the Kirchhoff principle. 
which says that everything about a crypto algorithm can be open except for the key. So I know exactly how it's being developed, I can see the source code, I can see the math behind it, I know everything except for the key. Okay? Same here. If I want verification, I need to have access to the system, I need to know how it's being programmed, the data is being used, etc. etc. Uh, if you have time, I wrote I, I write a lot of blog posts, and one of them is called The Shades of Black in the Black Box AI System. And it's all about that even if you talk about a black box system, it's not no pun intended, a black and white. There's shades of black. And for instance, how that works, go take a read on it. Um, and then there's implicit trust. This is the trust that is applicable for most of us today on any system, not only AI. It's, you have to trust the developer or you have to trust, to trust the system's behavior. When you go to an airport and board a plane, you implicitly trust a few things. That the plane is safe, that it's well maintained, and that the pilots are doing their job. The more you fly, probably the more trust you gain. Same with a self-driving car. In the beginning you might be scared. If you use a self-driving car for a year and you drive 60,000 kilometers across Canada, every time you get in the car and it takes you from A to B in, in, in a safe way, you build trust again. Yeah. This is, this is working. I don't need to know how it works, but it's working. Okay? Okay, so... I've been doing a, I've been doing a, a lot of things in this book. So finally, I came up with the Trust in AI framework. Okay? I'm going to explain how this model works. And I'm explaining you this model so that it gives you a little bit of hands and feet when you want to be more concrete about this whole trust problem. Okay. As you can tell, there are three main items in the middle. Data, infra and models. Models are algorithms that are being trained on data. Then there is safety, security and explainability around that. And then there is that big context circle around it. Because as I explained, the context defines a lot how you deal with the situation. Okay. Okay. Here's the key thing. If you read today on explainability, you may have heard terms like accountability algorithms, fairness in data, uh, responsible AI. Most of the time, they are talking about one or two things, and most of the time, it's even separate. One, the models, the algorithms. New networks are bad because they're black box. Deep learning is bad because you have no clue what they do. Okay? And the data. In particular, bias in data. I will spend a few minutes on bias in data because that's really a problem. Okay? However, my view is it has to be holistic. You have to look at all three components at the same time. What is the use of having secure data that allows the algorithm? What is the use of having a top notch algorithm when your data is not secure? What is the use of having secure data and a top notch algorithm on the infrastructure that starts? Okay? So you have to look at it in a holistic view. You cannot look at just one component. That's the key thing. Okay, so what does it mean, safe is being explainable? Safe is the system does not cause harm to the world. A self driving car is not supposed to go into a wall, period. A nuclear plant is not supposed to shut by itself, period. Okay? Secure, the other way, the world cannot harm the system. We should not be able to hack a self driving car. We should not be able to hack a critical infrastructure. Okay? And then explainable, well, this is worth uh, explains. You can explain exactly why the system behaves the way it does. Okay, so those are the three core aspects. And you might argue that in order to explain, you need transparency. So you need to have access to the system. That's not entirely true, because I can implicitly trust the system. So I don't know exactly how it works. I can explain why it does it, for example, recommend a system like that's probably showed me uh, a recommendation for Van Diesel because I'm watching movies containing the work, for example. I don't know exactly how it does it, but I trust the system because in this case I like those movies. So I can explain why the system recommends me those movies, but I have no transparency because I don't I cannot look into the system how it does it. So we're coming into the heavy details of the definition now, and I won't go into that details, but so high level the safety speed explainability around data and structure. Okay? And then the context is key, key important because 
sometimes you might say, like, you know what, data, I'm, I'm dealing with private data, I'm dealing with EII, I'm dealing with the GDPR. From a legislation point of view, I have to make sure that my data is secure, whether I like it or not. Or you might say, you know what, ethical, from an ethical point of view, I need to do the right thing for our society. I am not going to launch a system that they create half up, and I have no idea when it does it, why it does it, or how it does it. It's unacceptable. Okay? So, from an ethical point of view, you might take the stance. Any system that I build or deploy must have a certain trust like that. Okay? Business environment. Some, some business owners might say, you know what? If I have a system that's 99% accurate, but has a black box level of, let's say, 70%, which means it's a little bit shady, First, I have a system that may be 90% accurate, which is still good enough for me, but it has a full transparency. I might go for the second system. Some business owners might say, no, accuracy is number one. And I take it that it's 70% transparent, so you know what? I will, I will take the hit when I get there. So my point is, I'm not judging anybody who says, I'm going for a black box system. I'm just trying to have a discussion with the people. Like, before you make a decision, understand what you're getting into. Okay? Alright. Good. So, when you talk about those, this is, again, this is a 30,000 high feet level of you, right? So, when you talk about data, you talk about stuff like data problems. Can I get into the data problems? Bias in data, data privacy, data protection. So, let's uh, talk a uh, few minutes on. Bias in data. Bias in data is stuff that you read nowadays more and more in the paper and that's really become a problem. So remember, in an AI system, learning is key. How do they learn? Based on the sample data, whether it's labeled or unlabeled data. Keep that in mind. So if you bias in data, is that a problem? Yeah, there are just many different ways how you can get bias in your data. Okay? One well known one is it's difficult to see confirmation bias. We as humans have the tendency to believe or look for data that supports something that we believe in. They have done lots of research from a psychology point of view. Um, it's very difficult for humans to be objective. If you believe that climate change is not a problem, then you're going to try to find information cherry pick on facts that will show you that climate change is not a problem. And the other way That's human. Okay? So think about this. And it's because of humans who build those systems, bias will be inherently incorporated in those systems. Okay, so you have to keep an eye on that. I give you three examples um, how this go how this goes wrong uh, dramatically. This one, you may have heard about it. Google image classification. What happens here is okay, you set up a photo and the photo will try to recognize the face and will tell you um, or tries to recognize the image, the object in the image, or really tries to tell you what it is. For example, here's a car, airplane, graduation, gorillas. See my language, what the fuck? Gorillas. So this system classifies black people as gorillas. Well, it, can, it cannot get any worse than that in my, in my work. This is fucked up. Excuse my language. Okay? It can, this cannot happen even if you're Google. Okay? Another one is time. Microsoft a chatbot, so what happened is that it was a chatbot and um, it was a self running chatbot. So what happened within 24 hours, this chatbot became extremely racist and slurs saying it's like Hitler was great, Hitler was right. Now, think about it. How did that, how did it happen? Is it the developer's fault? Mm, not really. How did it learn? Data. Okay. Where did the data come from? Twitter feeds. Hmm. Twitter feeds were written by humans. In the system? I don't know. If I go with my grandson to the grocery store and he steals a, a bar of candy, and I say, yeah, good boy, it's fine. And I do this several times. He's going to consider that as normal behavior because he's been told that this is good. Okay, can you blame him? No, not really. So the point was that. Because it was being fed Twitter feeds by people, people started to realize that it's an automatic checkbook. 
let's play, let's play around a little bit. We start to feed racist information, and it turned out to be a racist event. Within 24 hours, the system was shut down. Okay, the last one, and this still rocks my mind, this was recently Amazon implemented an automatic HR recruitment system, so it can go through resumes. And systematically, after it started, it shut out resumes of female candidates. So only male candidates were being considered. Talking about FDR. Like, Amazon. How, how does that even happen? Well, it's very simple. Because the system was trained on resumes from predominantly Caucasian white males. This is where bias and data is becoming a problem. And this is becoming more and more. So, this is really a very hairy detail that you have to take into account. Okay, a few more slides and then I'm done. So, infrastructure. Oh, the normal stuff that you see is security professionals like, okay, how do you protect your storage, identity access management, uh, processing? Are you going to process it inside the cloud? And again, these are just a few questions. And then the models itself, so the algorithms. So, what type of algorithms are you using? <coughs> if you use deep, deep learning on your network, you know by definition that you start into the root of a black box. Okay, first, let's put some views uh, as a logistical impression. Okay? How do you do the training validation testing? Remember the bias in the data is all in here. Garbage in, garbage out. That still counts for AI. Okay? Um, so the model itself is innocent. It trains based on the data that you feed. That's why this is extremely important. That the bias in this is not contained in this data, sorry. But also that your validation test set is representative for the real life. If I train my system on male location, I cannot expect the system to perform on females, regardless. Okay? Uh, performance metrics and then the next thing. Okay, I can go on and on and on, and I won't, because it's uh, 10 to 11. So I would like to get the floor to questions if you have Question is, what is exactly the difference between machine learning and AI? So, if you look at this slide, <coughs> you see that the circle of AI is way bigger than the circle of machine learning. Okay? So, machine learning is an example of artificial intelligence, but there's more a different artificial intelligence. For example, you have a dog. Do you like dogs? Okay. What's your favorite dog? Don't have a favorite dog? Okay, watch this now. Okay. Um, okay. Which one is your favorite dog in this picture? intelligence, all the dogs, machine learning is one dog, deep learning is one dog, reinforcement learning is one dog. So machine learning is an example of all the field AIs, like a Bernice Mountain dog is a type of dog, Golden Retriever is a type of dog. Does that make sense? Yeah? Okay, awesome. That, that gentleman is not allowed to ask questions. Anyone else? <laughs> <laughs> You're not getting away from it. I, gotta, I, I want to start with how come moose doesn't go mooses and meese or whatever. I figured that one out here. But the, you were talking about pluralism there earlier. But I wanted a much more technical question. Or something actually maybe to ask you about your framework. And, we were talking about in ethics and that sort of thing. And we live in a world today full of very interesting trends in fascism and things that we learned a hundred years ago. And when we went to war and all that, we're seeing leaders that are taking those extremes and, and the human behavioral aspect, the impacts on the AI world, uh, scare the hell out of me in the context of you know what it does to the trends of future you know evolution of technology. What I really wanted to understand. 
with them was your thoughts around the frameworks of sort of with that in mind and the fact that we're driven by very much capital, right? The evolution of technology is all about hey, technology is all about hey man, I gotta make money, I gotta make money now, and what's the minimum security layer, minimum, minimum ethical layer, minimum whatever, viable layer to be the low cost compliant funded supported seed level startup, right? In this agenda that can actually lead us in a world full of fascism and a bunch of other things mm -hmm. into an accelerated agenda that can actually lead to big issues that Bill Gates and others are predicting, right? Yeah. What are your thoughts on, you know, just framework and how we have this dialogue and how we build this structure and, um, around AI because I think it's fundamental to our getting it right. It definitely is. Um, point well taken and uh, to the point as usual. Um, so here's what's happening. So there's my personal view and there's the global view. So one of the reasons, or I should say, the primary reason why I founded BCI is because I am concerned about how AI is going to be used in the web of society. I'm definitely not on the side of the design that is formula terminates the common. Not at all. I'm somewhere in the middle. I want to start a dialogue, and that's why these presentations are, are so important, that people start to understand what artificial intelligence is, what the potential problems are so that they can start to make informed decisions. So I want organizations to be aware that like instead of embracing the next AI tool or AI system, whatever it is, take a step back <coughs> and do your due diligence and um, assess what is it really about when it comes down to trust. And not only because you may want to, but because you have to, because the state is coming. So to our point, so that's my personal thing, that's why I'm very passionate about this. What's happening now since I would say 6 to 12 months, a few years ago when this all started, as with any new trend, everybody's all over the place. I mean, there's, talking about venture capitalists, there's so much money out there in that, I mean, if I, um, if I walk around with my grandson and as a teacher, like, he knows what AI is, investors will be all over him. You want money? You want candy? Tell me anything. You know? So, what we see now globally, and you see it start in the European Union, for example, is that people start to realize, like, hold on, hold on, this goes so quick, and I showed you the examples that where it goes terribly wrong, and there are many others, that yes, there is a lot of good, <coughs> and I definitely believe in the good of the I see lots of examples of good of the but it has to be responsible. So, you see starting discussion now, now on the European level, where they start to talk about ethics, you need to get we need to define an ethical framework. If you look at, for example, the, uh, the, the, the Geneva Convention, you sh they shall not use chemical weapons on, on, on other countries. Well, the fact that Syria does it, okay, there's always North well, Korea, maybe, there's always people who are running the system. So we need to have a Geneva Convention for artificial intelligence when it comes down to what is ethical, what is allowable, how can we reinforce it. So that discussion now is, is going on. But you know how it goes with the geopolitics, it takes a long time. So I personally think a um, couple of things. First of all, I think the industry has to be leading. We have seen that with cyber security, for example, if you look at cyber and we in this in this province, uh, which was also by out by the way, it's like they're doing the right thing for cyber security in NB and Canada. It's from the industry, yeah, okay, it's, it's a government uh, provincial organization, true, but still it is being fed by industry, it's being taken by industry. The same is going to happen, has to happen with artificial intelligence. Okay? Um, at the same time, it's an opportunity for Canada, for the government, as far as I'm concerned, for federal, step up to the plate and take the lead. You're already taking the lead in AI research and development. Why shouldn't we take the lead in ethics? Why shouldn't we take the lead in, 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 in cracking the hard nut here? Okay? So a little bit long answer now, but um, it's in the works, I guess, but it's, as usual, it goes slowly, and in the meantime, Guys like me, um, small buckets, drop in a bucket, we try to get it off the ground. On a personal level, um, what, what can we do in the case of uh, that we are faced with uh, data bias against us? Yeah. Well, sure question. <laughs> come, come on up, come on up. Um, it's a very good point. Um, unfortunately, Okay, let me, let me try to make this short. There are a couple of scenarios. Uh, you might be backed up by, uh, by law. For example, GDPR, 
prohibit automatic profiling without consent of users. Uh, I've written an extensive blog on uh, what the AI can impact this on GDPR. Article 22, if you want to read it, uh, there's a lot of very details to it. But to your point, Chris, um, you might be supported by law that you can go to a company and say, listen, you're acting on my data, I'm a European citizen, if you're a European citizen. Uh, I, I feel like I am not being profiled correctly, I want you to explain to me what happened and if not, I'm not taking it. That's the minority of the cases. If you look at Facebook, a lot of people ask things like, oh, Facebook, this is amazing. I mean, it's free and I can use it everywhere, and they ask, okay, do you understand why it's free? No. Do you understand what the product is? No. Or if you don't understand the product is, the product is you. Okay? So, in those situations, you give it a full entry, even without knowing that there's almost no recourse. It's like you're sucked in, and they have built a digital profile of you now, and it's very, very, very difficult, and not possible to change that. Okay? So, that's in the majority of the cases. That's why I think on a society level, it's so important that we get the discussion going, that we get more legislation that, uh, that is reinforceable for companies to do the right thing if, if they don't want to do it by, them, by themselves. So it's, um, yeah, it's, it's a problem at the moment. I mean, I wish I had better news, but that's not the case.